Great. Thank you so much. Sophie, morning, everyone. Welcome. We are going to look at that passage together. So as you can see, it's page 1135. You might like to turn to it. Uh, we are right at the end of Romans chapter 8. We've been going through Romans in order, and we've just reached this bit today. Very famous passage. I feel like I can't do it justice. Let's, um, let's pray and ask for God's help, shall we? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word and thank you for your Holy Spirit. And thank you, Father, that as we look at your word, your Holy Spirit opens our eyes and our hearts to know you and respond to you. And we pray, Father, that you would do that today, please, for each of us here. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, happy Platinum Jubilee uh, to the Queen and to all of us. Uh, we've had 70 years with our Queen on the throne and a big celebration this weekend. Now, whatever you think of the Queen and the monarchy, we all admire uh, the Queen's commitment, don't we? It's wonderful. 70 years worth. And on her 21st birthday, before she was Queen, she knew that building her whole life on this job was worth it. This is what she said. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. It's amazing, isn't it? The Queen thought it was worth building her life on this role. So what are we building our lives on? What are we building our lives on? Uh, this passage today, it's, it's very famous and it's, and it's awesome. But it's kind of important why it's here. Why is it here at the end of Romans chapter 8? We've had basically eight chapters of Paul doing like a sales pitch for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus. And he's been saying the good news of Jesus is so good because God does for us what we could never do for ourselves. He saves us and we could not save ourselves. And then we get to this bit at the end of chapter 8, and he says, what then shall we say in response to these things? As in all of that that you've heard so far. And so this is Paul's big moment. This is like his brave heart speech. He's kind of like bringing it all together and saying, this is what it means for you. And it's incredible. It's, it's like he's saying, is it worth building your life on this? On everything that you've heard, is it worth building your life on this? And the answer is absolutely yes, it is. I wonder, I wonder if we think it's worth building our lives on this, or whether it's just one of the many kind of good things that is in our lives. You know, we may like Jesus and we may even trust in Jesus, but our lives are really built around other things investing in other things and even when those things don't deliver you know there's a cost of living crisis there's a health crisis there's a relationship crisis and those things we've built our lives on don't deliver we're still not really sure that Jesus is the place the safe place that we need and instead we end up kind of trying to build our lives on, we're well, trying to fix our lives and fix our circumstances and those kinds of things. The question is, are we missing the point? Are we wasting our lives? Good question, hey? Well, Paul, he really, really wants the Roman Christians to build their lives on this, on the gospel of Jesus, for a very, very good reason. He wants their help. He wants their help to reach hopeless, lost people at the ends of the earth. So have a look at this. Right at the end of Romans, we see this. Paul says, I've been longing for many years to visit you. I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and that you will assist me on my journey there. He, Paul desperately wants the Christians in Rome to know the good news of Jesus is worth building their lives on so that they will want to serve others with the good news of Jesus. So that's why this passage is here. And that's what we're going to think about today. Two things we're going to see. Firstly, Jesus means we are never condemned. 
Secondly, Jesus means we are never separated. And the whole point of it is to be kind of like on fire with this news. It's so good. And Paul wants us to see it. So let's dive in. Romans chapter 8. Jesus means that we're never condemned. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, he says this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Friends, the the good news of Jesus is so worth building your life on. God is for us in Jesus if we're trusting in him. That's big news. Just think about that for a minute. Because maybe we think, oh, you know, the Christian faith is all about us being for God, right? It's about how for God we can be in all the things we have to do to strive to be for him. But it's actually the opposite. The Christian faith is the opposite of that. We've been seeing actually how not for God we, we often are. Often we believe the lie that we're better off without him and, and that we live our own way because of that as if he's not even there. And that is sin and it's, and it's awful. It's really, really awful. And we've seen how actually what it means is that God should be against us for how we treat him. It's really, really awful. He should be. I wonder if you've ever asked yourself what what you really deserve from God. What what do you think you really deserve from God? Not what you'd like to hope he's going to give you. Not what you'd like to hope he thinks of you. But what you actually deserve from a perfectly just God. It's a bit scary, isn't it, really? We deserve him being against us. And the incredible news of Jesus is that if you're trusting in his perfect son, Jesus, God is for you. It's incredible, isn't it? And it's not just wishful thinking. It's not just a nice idea. No, because we're told why. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? He's given up his son for us. Of course he's for us. I wouldn't give up my son for anyone, not anyone, not not even a friend, not even a relative, nobody. But God gave up his son, not for a friend, but for me, who was against God. It is, it's remarkable, isn't it? God has shown he's totally committed to people like you and me. You see, on the cross, my sin was condemned in Jesus. He was condemned and it's done. And so I am never condemned if I'm in Jesus by trusting in him. And you see, if God's done that for us, he's totally committed to us, isn't he? He will certainly bring me to eternal security and and resurrection life with him. Why would he do all of that and then give up on me and on you? It would be crazy. It would be like rescuing someone in a lifeboat you rescue them in the lifeboat and then you go, I can't be bothered to take them back to shore, really. Just can't really be bothered right now, you know, done the job. Rubbish, you wouldn't do that. Or like if you bought a Ferrari, right? You paid all that money for a Ferrari and you go, ah, feeling a bit tight. I can't really afford the petrol. I'm just not going to drive it, that kind of thing. Be crazy, wouldn't it? God's done all this for you. If he's done all of this for you, he's certainly going to keep you to the end, going to bring you to resurrection life. Now, if you don't know that, that certainty for yourself, please grab hold of it. Cling to Jesus and God will say, I am for you. I'm for you. Even if you've lived against him. And it is amazing. If you've done that, it should change how you think about your security and where you stand with God. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Now be honest. We know there are people who who we have wronged, aren't there? Who, Who could bring charges against us in God's court and say, Ben has wronged me. And we feel ashamed of that, don't we? 
And there are people that we've acted wrongly with, actually, and who could accuse us also in God's court and say, no, Ben acted wrongly with me. And maybe you know that yourself and you feel very ashamed of that. And then there are our consciences, and our consciences accuse us too, don't they? And Satan loves to to make our consciences accuse us. But in God's court, nobody, nobody can bring charges against you and me if we're in his son Jesus. Because it's actually God himself who justifies. You see that? It's God who justifies. That that word, you know when you self-justify, You're basically saying, I am right, I'm self-justifying. Well, this isn't self-justifying, this is God justifying you and saying he, she is right. Now, who's going to argue with God? If God says you're right with him, who's going to argue? It's like, um, forgive this example, but it's a bit like a kind of shady mafia trial, right? You know when the judge is paid off in advance, right? And the verdict is absolutely certain. Basically, everyone's paid off in advance, so it's, it's totally certain. Now, that's unjust, obviously. But God is totally just, and the verdict is totally certain, because he's already declared us right with him. The verdict's already been given because the price has already been paid. It was Jesus who paid the price. And the trial, well, we know what's going to happen, don't we? Actually, it's even better than that. It's even better than that because in God's court, who's the lawyer? Who's the lawyer who's making the case for you? It is Jesus. Jesus, Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Interceding for us. That's remarkable. That's what a lawyer does. Our sin against God is shameful. It is horrible. It deserves God to be against us. But Jesus is right there at God's right hand, right now, and he is showing his father the nail marks in his hand. And he is saying, that sin, I paid for it. That sin, I paid for it. Ben's sin, I paid for it. And that is amazing, isn't it? He's your lawyer. Can, can you imagine Jesus doing that right now for you and for, and for the sins you're so ashamed of? And Jesus is right there with God the Father saying, I paid for it. I paid for it. If you feel too guilty to be forgiven, can you see how this is perfect security? There, there isn't anything better than this. There's nothing better to build your life on than this. Nothing better to be proud of than this. Not a a career, not a lifestyle, not a family. Nothing compares to this. And isn't isn't it worth investing our lives in this? And particularly in others knowing this, this security. I mean, our queen has built her life on serving others because she thinks it's important. And and millions of people are celebrating that this weekend, and they have no idea about this, this hope. And today is Pentecost Sunday, when we we remember the Holy Spirit coming to be with God's people. And what happens when the Holy Spirit arrives with God's people? They start to tell everyone from every nation the good news because that's what god wants he wants everyone to know this security what are we investing in what are we investing our time in what are we investing our money in what's our focus friends don't waste your life don't waste it jesus means that we are never condemned isn't that worth investing in for other people And Jesus means that we are never separated. This is what we see next. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? What do you reckon the answer is? Of course not. It's it's great that if we're trusting in Jesus, of course, that we're in his love. That's a lovely thing, isn't it? You're trusting in Jesus, you're in his love. That's a great thing. There is a problem there, isn't there? 
What about when we don't feel like it? What about when we don't feel in Jesus' love? When the circumstances of our life make us question that? You know, Paul is saying, oh, you've got security. Oh, that's great, I've got security. I don't feel like it, Paul. Do you ever feel that? You feel kind of distant from God and his love, and you don't really feel sure of it. Well, Paul is wanting to say here, at the end of chapter 8, that even then, even in suffering, which is what we were thinking about last week, we can be assured. We can actually even be safe. Because even though we suffer, we are not separated from God's love. That's what he's saying. Actually, the reason we're not separated from God's love when we suffer is exactly the same reason why we're not condemned. They're kind of linked. Have a think about this for a second. God's punishment for sin is separation from him, isn't it? It's death. That's what it is. So Adam and Eve, they were cast out of the garden, separated from God. Israel, they were cast out of the promised land into exile, separated from God. But we're not separated from God, are we? Because there's no condemnation for our sin if we're trusting in Jesus. And so we may suffer, but we're not separated from God because of our sin. No, we're not. And Paul quotes from this psalm, this Psalm 44, where God's people, they were scattered among the nations. They were separated from the promised land. They were. But the psalm is all about how they hadn't broken his covenant. They were being faithful to him. But they were suffering. But they were suffering for his sake as his people. And just like we saw last week, Christians are not immune from suffering. We will suffer just like everyone else all the time. And more than that, we'll actually suffer worse than other people. Millions of Christians live in fear of persecution and many are killed every day simply for trusting in Jesus. But if we know the good news of Jesus, we know that's not because God is angry with us. We're not being punished. We're not being abandoned. He's not stopped loving us. I used to um, visit a man who was in his 60s who was suffering with leukemia uh, in London. And I used to visit him every week. And every week in hospital, I'd ask him, well, how are you? And he'd, he was a Christian guy. And he'd always say to me, Ben, the Lord is with me. And I said, oh, that's lovely. And, um, and uh, I'd ask him sometimes, you know, are you feeling lonely? Are you feeling isolated? And he'd say things like, oh, Ben, I'm just having such sweet times with the Lord. And you know what? To my shame, I thought, oh, that's a lovely word, isn't it? But how on earth, how on earth can he be serious? Here's this guy in hospital with leukemia. But I've been learning, actually, he really meant it. He really meant it. Suffering actually make, made him feel closer to God. Not more distant, but closer. And, and he's doing well now in his health, praise God. And to be honest, he is much closer to God now than he was before the suffering. And Paul is saying, you see, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's not, it's not um, with all these things being avoided that we're more than conquerors. It's in all these things, in these things, we're more than conquerors, in the midst of them, in suffering. We're still conquerors. We're conquerors because we still have eternal blessing, but we're more than conquerors. I think what Paul means is that, just like my friend I used to visit, it strengthens our faith. Suffering actually strengthens our place in Christ. We saw it in chapter 5, didn't we? Suffering grows perseverance. Perseverance grows hope. Isn't that great? The good news of Jesus is that it's so secure, being in Jesus, that, that nothing, not even suffering, not even death, can diminish it. There is no safer place to be, no matter what you go through. Isn't it worth building your life on that, on this, Paul is saying? Uh, John Chrysostom was uh, an early church leader uh, who was persecuted. And he was on trial for his life. And we're told that the emperor said to Chrysostom, um, we will banish you. 
And he replied, you cannot banish me, for the whole world is my father's home. Well then, we will execute you. And he replied, no, you cannot. My life is hid with Christ. Well then, the emperor said, we will dispossess you of your estate. You cannot. I haven't got any. All my treasure is in heaven. Well then, the emperor said, we will put you in solitary confinement. You cannot, for I have a divine friend from whom you can never separate me. I defy you. There is nothing you can do to hurt me. And brothers and sisters, that is a precious truth, isn't it? No matter what happens, nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus. Absolutely nothing. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it just makes me think of Ukraine, really. I don't know about you, but the last few months I've just been thinking, how would I cope if I was Ukrainian? What, what would that do to my faith? How would I cope? And this is the answer, isn't it? I would know, I would know that I'm not separated from the love of Christ. And it would be very precious. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And so, and so Paul finishes this rousing speech after eight chapters of incredible truth. And why is it here? It's because he wants the Roman Christians to build their lives on this and to want to reach other people with it. At the very ends of the earth, what they thought were the ends of the earth then, Spain. And actually, that is why we've been looking at Romans. Some of you have ever asked yourself, why on earth are we looking at Romans? This is the reason. It's not just for some clever theology. That's not the reason. It is to get our hearts, our hearts fired up to reach those who are lost. So, what are you building your life on? What are you building your life on? And does it show? Does it show in your attitude to those who are not yet in the safe place, place which is Christ? What are we investing in? Are we wasting our lives? Now, the reason I keep using that phrase is because John Piper does. Uh, he's, a, he's a preacher and a writer. And uh, when I was a newish Christian, um, his book, uh, Don't Waste Your Life, made a really big impact on me. And uh, this book actually started by accident, bizarrely. It started with an illustration um, John Piper used in a, a big open air sermon. And he was telling this big crowd about these two ladies in his church who built their lives on telling people about Jesus. And then in their late 60s, they were in a car crash together and they both died. And, and John Piper was saying, is that a tragedy? Is that a tragedy? And what he said next affected me and lots of young Christians actually, as he read from a magazine article about what is really a tragedy. I'm gonna play you the video. I haven't checked the sound. James is gonna be on it though, don't worry. And uh, let's have a little, little watch. February 1998. Bob and Penny took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30 foot trawler, play softball, and collect. Shells. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. And there are people in this country that are spending billions of dollars to get you to buy it. With all my heart, I plead with you, don't buy that dream. A nice house, a nice car, a nice job, a nice family, a nice retirement, collecting shells. As the last chapter, before you stand before the creator of the universe to give an account 
with what you did. Here it is, Lord, my shell collection. Look, Lord, my shell collection. Don't waste your life. Don't waste it. There's John Piper being passionate. Um, you know, our queen has built her life on something she really thinks is important, hasn't she? And it's admirable. It's wonderful. If we really think the good news of Jesus is, is this important that Paul thinks it is, won't we build our lives on that? Won't we build on our, our lives on it for ourselves, the safe place to be? And won't we build our lives on investing in others to hear this? Don't waste your life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. You are so kind to us. Thank you that Jesus means we are never condemned if we're in him and there is no safer place to be. Thank you, Father, so much. And Father, thank you that Jesus means we are never separated from your love. There is nothing that can ever separate us. We are perfectly safe and secure forever. And Father, thank you, this is well worth building our lives on personally. But Father, it's also so worth building our lives on letting others know about this and helping others know about this. So Father, please, please would we not waste our lives. Please, Father, would we be doing what Paul talks about, assisting that work of many hearing. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.